What's going on guys? Today I bring you another Destiny 2 news video and today I have news on new exotics, reasoning behind gear loadout changes, nightfall changes and much more. But before we go any further guys, I am giving away a Rockstar Destiny 2 in-game exclusive gear code. To win it, simply drop a like on this video and leave a comment. Okay, so this info comes straight out of the latest Edge magazine. Let's go. I'm going to start with nightfalls. The weekly nightfall, once the most attritional activity in all of Destiny. A rock hard fight against over leveled bullet sponge enemies that kicked you back into orbit if your entire team died. This is now a timed challenge. The limit will vary. Smith gives a 13 minutes as an example, but you'll need to be efficient as well as effective. Something which will only be possible if a team settles on strategy beforehand, then properly executes it. That is kind of interesting, the Nightfall now is a timed challenge. Me personally, I did like it how it was in year one, if your whole team died. You got sent straight back to orbit and you had to start from the beginning. It made it fun for solo challenges and much, much more. They then introduced checkpoints into the Nightfall, which I thought was completely pointless, but yeah. And now within Destiny 2, it's going to be a timed challenge, so you'll get a set time. If you don't do it in that time, I'm guessing you failed a Nightfall. Okay, so we're going to get into loadout changes and the reason behind this. Okay. So so the idea is most deeply rooted in the new and somewhat controversial way in which weapons are classified in Destiny 2. In the previous game, you had primary weapons, rifles, hand cannons and the like. Secondaries were snipers, shotguns, sidearms and uh, fusion rifles. And heavies were rocket launchers, machine guns and swords. In the sequel, heavies and more secondaries have been bundled together in a single slot and are now known as power weapons. The other two slots are for what used to be called primaries, kinetic weapons fire standard ballistic bullets, while the energy variants add elemental effects, dealing bonus damage to enemies with appropriately coloured shields. It's a change that has not gone down too well within the Destiny community. Players see it as evidence of Bungie being so desperate to fix long-standing problems in the Crucible, the game's PvP component, where shotguns and snipers have long reigned infuriatingly, insta-killingly supreme at the expense of a PvP game, where it seems as if the options have been taken away from players. Smith readily admits the change has been at least partly implemented to make life easier for Bungie's design teams. It's about, as a designer, being able to understand how much a player is going to be able to bring to bear, but stresses there are benefits to players in both modes. The game's beta did not contain the final implementation of how energy weapons work against AI combatants with elemental shields. For instance, when the shield is depleted, it explodes nuking any enemies that happen to be nearby. Yet beneath the spectacle lies once again the team's desire to make players plan ahead and talk. Smith asks us to picture running the water glass using the Destiny 2 weapon system. Imagine the conversation you're going to have when you're about to do the Oracle phase, he says, referring to the section where players must quickly take down a series of randomly spawning spheres of light and will be instantly killed if they miss even one before it disappears after a few seconds, while also dealing with waves of high level enemies. Who's bringing a sniper rifle? Who's bringing a fusion rifle for the Minotaurs? You're now putting those powerful things in conflict with a rocket launcher, which is for area of effect wave clearing and can effectively replace something like a Nova Bomb. Well now, Nova Bomb could be more important because not everybody's running a sniper rifle and rocket launcher. What this system does is make player power more predictable, but it also allows supers in a number of ways to shine even brighter in the game. Talking on behalf of Edge now, our visit to Bungie coincides with the launch of Destiny 2's beta, and while our visions of a workforce running manically around a studio on fire fail to come to pass, the game's first time in the world adds a complicating element to the story. Normally we play and Bungie talks, yet while we were at the studio, millions of people around the world were also playing the game, forming opinions on it, discussing it, and before long, complaining about it to high heaven. Smith quickly took to Twitter to assure the Destiny community that the beta was based on a months old build of the game that had undergone extensive tuning since. But that wasn't enough. The new weapon system was one bone of contention. Another was the length of ability cooldowns, the timers which dictate when you get to use the thrilling space magic, which is as fundamental to Destiny's enduring appeal as its wonderful over-the-top arsenal. 
and the unending thirst for loot the game fosters in its most committed players. So yes, relax, base cooldowns are lower in the final game than they were in the beta. Yet there is a wider structural change at play here, one born of very different philosophy to that which drove the first game's design. Their cooldowns were mostly reduced by stats and randomly rolled on pieces of armour. They were passive, bestowed upon you automatically by the things you wore. Here they are active. If you want your next grenade more quickly, you're going to have to work for it. Take for example our beloved Warlock. A perk in the Dawnblade subclass lets us speed up the recharge rate of our grenade with airborne kills. An exotic chest piece acquired during the campaign when our character's level is still in single figures makes us have that in place while we aim down our gun sights in the air. Now let's pause for a second to talk about that exotic. Now this exotic I believe we have seen within many trailers within the game. I believe it's the warlock exotic where it looks like he's got golden wings on his back. It just makes sense. An exotic chest piece acquired during the campaign which makes us have it in place when we aim down our gun sights in the air. I mean gold and wings on your back making you hover seems legit to me interesting you get it from the campaign as well not from a random drop so getting straight back into it starting where we left off talking about that exotic chess piece acquired during the campaign when our character's level is still in single figures makes us hover in place when we aim down our gun sights in the air dispatch four or five enemies while airborne and our grenade is ready once again doing so is a risk of course there is no cover in the sky so we are a static target in the line of sight of every enemy on the battlefield but it's a neat summation of the way Bungie is treating abilities in Destiny 2 acquiring them involves more input from the players than before but the rewards for using them have been significantly increased. Grenades now hit like magical elemental powered trucks and are no longer solely used for clearing low level ads. Chuck one at a boss and the effects are dramatic. Smith gives us another warlock example, the devouring state. Triggered either by scoring a kill with your melee ability or by consuming a grenade by holding instead of tapping the throw button. When the value is active, kills restore your health and also accelerate your grenade cooldown. Charge it up quickly enough and you can stay in the devour state for as long as there are enemies around you for you to kill. Your health is constantly topping up, your grenades recharging in seconds. It sounds like a good deal, better than crossing your fingers and hoping for that perfect piece of gear from a random number generator then letting the stats do all the work. While Smith is explaining this to us, people on the internet are complaining because their gloves no longer come with numbers. The thinking behind this is to make ability recharge a part of the gameplay's loop, Smith says. We want to present opportunity and choice that means players can customise themselves more, but doing so will also involve a trade-off and making difficult decisions. That's been our approach. How do these different elements conspire to create interesting combinations that lead to strengths and weaknesses in each character? So some interesting facts right there. I'm just absolutely glad to hear that cooldowns on abilities and supers have been reduced since the beta. I mean, in the beta, they were just ridiculously long. I also love the idea of the Warlock Devourer state as well. I mean, that seems a little OP in the right circumstances. And it's also good to hear as well that grenades hit like a truck, as they say. So they're going to be a lot more useful in Destiny 2 than what they are in Destiny 1. I mean, obviously in Destiny 1, you can use them to take out a few ads, but in this, they seem they do serious damage. So that's great news. And as I said a long time, the weapon loadout changes within Destiny 2 were put in place so teams going into the Nightfall, teams going into the raids, have to actually have a decent conversation on who's using what. It's more strategic, it's more team based and from day one, from the first trailer we saw gameplay of this game, I thought that to be the direction Bungie were trying to take the game. And guys, that is the end of the video. Let me know down below in the comment section what you think about the things I've mentioned in this video. Thanks as always for stopping by and I will see you on that next one.